Welcome to Pin the Q Productions. If you are interested in the culture of the fire service and keeping tradition alive, you have come to the right place. Now sit back and relax with your brothers and sisters and enjoy the show. Be sure to like and subscribe on all social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. For more information on Pin the Q Productions, visit www.pintheq.com. Everyone, welcome back to Pin the Q Productions, and we have someone with us for the first time. We have an author, and of course, it's a firefighter, because otherwise, it probably wouldn't be on the show. So, uh, John, welcome to Pin the Q, bro. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You uh, give me the invite. Yeah, absolutely, man. When I when I sold the book, and actually, um, someone else reached out and said, "Hey, you, you probably should look into this guy and uh, see what he's about." And then when I did. I was uh, I was happy to see that obviously not only you're an author but this is a pretty interesting story which we're going to get into but you're a firefighter through and through. Thank you and and Mike Nasty is the one that uh, yeah actually pointed me uh, towards you. I've, I've known him since he was uh, 16 years old. He's a, I can't even call him a kid no more. He's uh, he's a lieutenant now, but he's a good guy, good firefighter. Yeah, actually, he uh, he had said that you had a lot to do with uh, the success of his career and and, uh, and him coming up. So it's it's good. I wouldn't say all that, but <laughs> well, that's what he said. <laughs> so, bro, welcome to the show. You, uh, man, is a pretty big deal. And I remember when we spoke, you said you never in a million years thought you'd actually write a book because you don't like to read. So that's interesting. I read a lot in college. Uh, I read when I'm teaching, but my time is limited and uh, I wish there were more hours in the day. I have a stack of books that I want to read, but. Yeah, writing a book was never uh, a plan that I had. I never thought that, you know, it was never my bucket list. I never thought I'd ever write a book, but somehow it fell in my lap and I was fortunate enough to to get this story put together and, and get it put out there. That's pretty cool. And it, it's actually really interesting. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to even learning more about this, as I'm sure everyone else watching is as well. But before we get too far into this, brother, why don't you, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell about who you are. So my name is John Rife. I actually turned 40 yesterday. Uh, and I've been in the Happy fire birthday. Department. Thank you. <laughs> I've, uh, I've been in the fire department since 96 and I bounced around quite a bit. I live in uh, Southern Maryland. Uh, this is where I started volunteering at and I, I've been volunteering here since 96. Uh, and then when I was uh, 20 years old, I got hired by the federal fire department uh, and worked there for four years. I was actually working on 9-11 uh, when the plane crashed into the Pentagon and I was working at the Naval Research Lab, which is in DC. And then after 9-11, I went to work for the US Capitol Police Hazardous Materials Response Team. And we basically uh, dealt with uh, weapons of mass destruction, terrorist activities, so on and so forth. Left there, went to work for DC Fire Department. I worked there for 10 years. And then uh, just about five years ago, I, I went to work for the city of Annapolis, which is where I currently work. So, man, you bounce around a little bit with uh, some big cities there. So, I mean, you just you just went right through that. Tell me a little bit about working for the feds on the uh, on the hazmat team. That that must have been really interesting work. It was interesting. The federal fire department was a great place to work. Um, the turnoff for me at the time was was the shift work. Right. It, you know, the shift work back then was twenty four on twenty four off. Twenty four on twenty four off. There were some days you'd go to work. You were, you know you were there for five days straight. Great guys. Great place to work. Um, but I was young, you know, right. and when you're young, you want the, all the action. Uh, and then after nine 11, you know, the big thing was terrorism and everything else. So I went to work for the U S Capitol police hazmat team. And, uh, prior to working there, when I worked for the federal government, I, I, I got quite a bit of hazmat training where I worked at, at the Naval research lab in DC. So I went to, uh, the Capitol police as a civilian working on Capitol Hill, as a uh, hazmat technician and uh thought i i had something to offer to the team i was 23 years old and uh lo and behold i had nothing <laughs> really really <laughs> much to offer except that i was young right. and uh it, it wasn't my it wasn't my pace you know i i was still young i wanted to go 100 miles an hour wanted to you know be up for 24 hours um dc fire department was where i always wanted to go work at and uh 
a year into the job there, you know, DC finally called and offered me a job and that's where I went to work at. You know, I ask a lot of, uh, a lot of guys, you know, when they're first starting out and they finally get that full-time job, you know, they, they punch your ticket, man. Talk about that a little bit, like how it was for you when, when you got your dream job to go to DC. Well, I tell you, for me, uh, when, when DC finally called and offered me the job and I left the Capitol Police, when you, when you want to talk about pay, I uh, cut my pay ridiculously. Oh, I'm sure. Because I was, uh, the budget at the time for the U.S. Capitol Police was unlimited because it was right after 9 11 and Congress took care of that. Well, and, Homeland Security money. Yeah, you know how politics goes. They, okay. they paid us very, very well. Uh, I was young at the time, I was living in a volunteer firehouse. Uh, so I was just banking money. And when I told my friends and family and my girlfriend at the time that I was leaving to go to DC Fire Department, they thought that I had uh, bumped my head. Uh, <laughs> but it was DC Fire Department, you know what I mean? It's like yeah, you know, from Chicago or New York City or, or anywhere else. You know, that's that's what I wanted to do. And then, uh, you know, my close firefighter friend said, man, you're crazy if you don't take this job. So that's where I did. I, I went to DC and I got to be honest with you, you know, doing hazmat, you know, I learned a lot. I, I went there thinking I knew something. I learned a tremendous amount when I worked for the Capitol Police when it came to hazmat and terrorism and stuff like that. I thought I knew something. I was young. I was dumb. Right. But D.C. was, you know, that, that was, that's where you want to go when you're young. You want to go to a big city. You want to catch all the action. Absolutely. And that's, that's a busy city. So they, they had a lot going on there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So what was it like? You know, were you, were you an engine company, I'm assuming, when you first started? Yeah, when I started there, I went to uh, Engine Company 3, which, coincidentally enough, is first due to uh, Capitol Hill. Oh, no kidding. So I, I knew the area, area very well, uh, but where I worked at Engine 3, it's high rises, um, a lot of alarm bells, and that's not what I wanted. I wanted to go where, where the action was. I wanted to go uh, where all the shootings, the stabbing, yeah. the fires were at, where you, know, you were running 30 calls a day on an engine company. So... Uh, when my probation was coming up, I had a, I had a really good battalion chief, Roy Ridgeway. And, uh, he said, they, they want you to come to engine 30. Uh, the officers there, you know, have called attention to you and would like for you to come there. And that's, that's really where I wanted to go. Um, so I got off probation and next thing I knew I was going to engine 30, um, where they were doing, you know, 30 runs a shift on the engine and that's not counting the truck company, the ambulance, the medic, you know, I mean, they were, we, were, we were doing 95 runs a shift out of that, that house. Wow. For hours. Man. We were getting our bus kicked. I loved it though. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's before you know it, it's time your tours over your time. It's time to go home. Yeah. And, and take a, take a nap. <laughs> you know, I love hearing stories like that, man. Um, when, you know, officers and bosses are, are looking and they're, and they're watching on the fire ground or seeing who, who's doing what they're supposed to do and, you know, who's the first to pick up the saw, who's the first to start, start up the ladder, you know, and then they're like cherry picking those guys. Like, hey, you know what, that's, that's the guy I want on my, you know, my tour and that's the guy I want on my house. So I love hearing stories like that. Yeah, absolutely. It was a great place. Uh, at the time that it was the fourth busiest engine company in the, uh, in the country, we got our butts kicked, but I got to tell you, I, I learned a lot. And, and the officers I had there were, top notch they had 30 35 years on they had been there and done that they had they'd seen everything yeah, pure um, and, and and they they still love the job you know yeah, it's amazing right. it's funny that we always say like oh, i can't believe you get paid for this it's true though I, I i it's just an awesome job and and you talk about that pay cut you took from the capitol police to dc fire i'm sure it was significant yeah, it was significant but yeah. i i have people ask me now if, if i regret you know what i did i not one bit. No, I know that. It, even if, it, you know, it's a, it's a life lesson, you know, but you got to follow where your passion is at. If you're not happy, you got you have to do what, what your heart's telling you to do. Absolutely. Yeah. And I 100% believe that you, know, you got to be happy. I mean, you only get one, one go at this, so you got to do what makes you happy. Absolutely. So, so DC fire and then how'd, how'd you end up in Annapolis? By the way, I love Annapolis. It's, that's a fun city. So, uh, I left DC and, uh, Basically, what happened is I had uh, a job offer to come to Annapolis. Um, I had got promoted through the ranks through D.C. Uh, <laughs> I, I ended up getting promoted, and I went back to Engine 3, which is the place that I didn't want to be. But that's another story for the books with the, the current chief at the time. Right. Uh, but Annapolis City called and offered me a job, and it was kind of one of those offers I couldn't refuse. Uh, I was no longer, you know, 23-year-old Um and it was something I really had to think long and hard about. Absolutely. Uh, 
So it, yeah. Annapolis was was the calling. It's, it's what I decided to do. It wasn't an overnight decision. It was something I had to think long and hard about, talk to my wife about. Um, we had to look at money, and I was able to roll things over. But Annapolis is where I went, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I did it. Was it hard for you to leave as a boss? I mean, you know, because everything you put into D.C. to get to get to be a boss, and then now you're able to kind of make a footprint, and now, now you got to go. Was it hard? No, because I still talk to all the guys that I – you know, I hung out with and worked with in DC. They're still great friends of mine. Um, you just, you transition into another, another fire department. Uh, you know, I left that officer's rank, which right. like, you know, you can always move back up again, but absolutely in the long run, it was kind of, you know, like when I left the federal government and went to the Capitol police and left the Capitol police, went to DC, it was at the time it was the right thing. Now, uh, I'm at a point in Naples is a great place. It's three fire stations. You know, every, single person that works there on every shift it's very small right very close-knit and it's one of those departments where honestly if you're a if you're a good person and you you're a good firefighter and you have a good good passion for the job you're gonna you know you're gonna do well for yourself now if you're one of those other guys that it's just a job right people will recognize that really quickly yeah and you people find out who you are before you know who they are <laughs> well that it it has to be that way, bro. It can't be in another way. Absolutely. Now, this time, just during this time that you're doing a career work, I mean, were you still staying active with the volunteer as a volunteer? Yeah, I've been a volunteer since then. I've I, I've only been in uh, two volunteer firehouses uh, in in Southern Maryland. And that was Huntingtown and Dunkirk, and I was at Huntingtown for eighteen years. I was the chief there for six years, and now I volunteer. I, I moved further north so i volunteered at a different firehouse now dunkirk um which is the white apparatus right white apparatus yep. yeah i just i just saw on instagram man what a beautiful ladder man oh uh, it's it's gorgeous. it's one of a kind seagrave did a uh, fabulous job yeah, building man. that for us yeah, it's awesome small yeah. world <laughs> yeah, I, li- I literally just saw that right today i'm like that thing is awesome it's nice yeah that's cool so in annapolis Tell me a little bit about the culture of that fire department versus DC. I mean, outside of the the obvious, which is the urban interface, what what else? How is it different culture wise? It's not much different. Uh, you know, it's a small department, mm-hmm. but culture wise, it's not different. Every city is is the same, it, whether it's the size of New York or it's the size of Annapolis. Right. Very big, very small, but you still have your different building constructions, you still have the different incomes of people that live there, the different clientele. The nice thing about the the firehouse that I work at every day is we sit where several interstates come together. Um, So we're very busy. Uh, And we run, I don't even know what the square mile radius is, but there's 17 17 different box alarm areas that we could respond to if a fire breaks out. and we have, it's it's interesting because I've lived my entire life 45 minutes from Annapolis. And when Annapolis hired me, I thought I knew that area like the back of my hand, but I didn't. You can literally uh, drive down a street and pass through Section 8 housing and go a mile further. And then you're into areas where there's $5 million homes with that are surrounded by horse farms. It's it's, it's absolutely crazy. Every time that we go on a call, you have no clue where you're going to go. You could go into, you know, Section 8 apartments uh, and then, you know, an hour later walk into a house that's, you know, five, ten million dollars. It's, it's unbelievable. And that's, I, why, I like that. that's why it's so crucial to know your, your, your response areas, you know, because just what you just said. You know, yeah, that. and then we, we have the historic area of Annapolis that you know, every so often catches on fire. And usually when those places catch on fire, it's, it's like a matchstick. we got a couple buildings going. Right. They're all, they're all common cockloft, right? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah that's, I love that city, by the way, man. I've been there several times, and uh, it, it's a fun place to be, definitely. Absolutely. It, I love it there. There's good sights there. <laughs> yeah, yes, there is. <laughs> so, so, bro, tell me a little bit about um, how being a volunteer chief and then – being a career firefighter, how those two things work beautifully together as far as training? Uh, as far as training, it's nice because I, I, I never want to, I, I try to separate the two, right? But I have learned a lot throughout the years. I've made a lot of mistakes throughout my life. Um, 
And being a chief, I've seen the same people come up through the reins that were getting ready to or made the same mistakes that I made. And working in Annapolis, uh, being 40 years old, I, I see very young guys come up through the ranks that are, you know, potentially going to make the same decision. It's kind of interesting because, they, you know, a, a few of those guys do look up to me uh, when it comes to decision making. And uh, I don't ever try to, you know, push it around like I've been there and I've done that. But uh, I'm always willing to, you know, help somebody if they if they have a question or, you know, uh, an issue arises and, and, and I've been teaching for Mifri for quite some time. So, uh, all that kind of molds together to kind of help those guys out. And that, that's exactly what I mean when I say that, because, you know, those guys that they get it, you know, the guys and girls in this job that volunteer, it doesn't matter if you get a paycheck or not to fire, don't know any different, but the ones that really care about this job and have passion for it, that want to learn and kind of want to leech on like, those those tentacles they're going to go to you and say hey boss tell me about this or what do you think about that you know they're going to they're going to come to you because you're doing this every day i mean this is you know this is your career so it affords you opportunities that other people may not have in a volunteer house so they should be like leeching on and getting that experience as much as much as they can absolutely you know that i we try to preach that all the time it doesn't matter what your position is career volunteer it doesn't matter you know when you're combat ready or combat ready, regardless of what it is. We have a job. Right. Yeah. It doesn't good. matter where you're at. It's good stuff, man. So tell me a little bit about um, balancing that family, right? So you, you have a family and then trying to balance the job and, and, you know, everything else that's going on in your life, the book, like walk me through some of that. Uh, I, we don't have enough time in the day. Uh, <laughs> I'm married. I have a, uh, a 16 month old. Uh, I have my wife is due to be pregnant February 19th. Holy moly. Yeah, you're going to be busy. I, yeah. I'm going to have two children that are 18 months apart <laughs> and I'll be 40. <laughs> uh, and I work in Annapolis. I'm the uh, deputy chief of a volunteer firehouse. I teach for Mifri regularly. I own a CPR and first aid business. Oh, good for you. And then I've got the book and the nice book and also. So I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm constantly, uh, I'm constantly, <laughs> I, I got to tell you, if, if you were to uh, ask anybody in my life, my biggest issue is time management. I just, it's tough, man. You, it you is, got, your, but, you got your plate full and it's going to get even more full. Yeah, it, it is. You know, but one day I hopefully, you know, my son and my future son, because it's going to be boy also will, you know, look at how hard I busted my butt. Yeah. To, you know, give him something. We have a nice house. We live in a great community. Um, you know, I can remember my parents doing the same thing, busting their butts, and times were, you know, weren't always easy. But, you know, that's what it's all about. And that's my good. wife, my wife will complain a lot, uh, but, you know, I want to make sure that we, you know, life is taken care of. Absolutely, I have two daughters myself, and and uh, it is it is a difficult balance sometimes, and that's why I ask you because you know people don't always realize that you know it's like a juggle on act, bro. Right. I uh, I teach. I teach CPR classes uh, for my for my side business, and you know it's a two year certification. And I tell them, I tell all the all the people, a lot of the my uh, students are women, and I tell them that I have another kid on the way, and I'm 40. And they say, "How are you going to do it?" And I said, "Well, if you call me in two years to recertify, and I don't answer, it's because I'm dead." <laughs> That's why <laughs> they, they killed me. My two my two sons killed me. <laughs> Bro, I like asking guys. Um... You know, we're, we're almost the same age, so uh, I'm a little older, but talk to me about the kitchen table dynamic, the firehouse kitchen table. Woo! Well, uh, it's no holds barred. Yep. Uh, it, and it's 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 well known that it doesn't matter who you are. I, I The nice thing about, here's one thing about Annapolis, which was a little bit different from D.C. One thing about Annapolis is we our firehouse is attached to headquarters, which is where the fire chief and the deputy fire chief uh, sit at. The deputy fire chief has been a great friend of mine since I was 14 years old. Fire chief is an awesome guy. He's one of those uh, firemen's firemen. He, awesome. he, he went through the ranks. Um, but when you are at the table, it doesn't matter who you're at. 
there's no rank. Nope. And they'll tell you there's no rank. And uh, some of the guys that, that I work with uh, that will watch this whenever this is posted will tell you that <laughs> I'm probably one of the worst when it comes to having no filter at the table. And some people have walked out of the room <laughs> in fear of their job because of what comes out of my mouth. But the nice thing about it is when, listen, when, when you're at work and you're getting your butts kicked and, you know, we have meals sitting in the oven, trying to stay warm, waiting for other units to come back so we can all sit down and eat together. Right. That's one of the times where everybody gets to sit down, enjoy a meal, talk about whatever they want to talk about and literally talk about whatever they want to talk about. Uh, the, the table is where everything happens at. That's where the decisions are made at. Absolutely. That's yeah. when you fire chief, the deputy chief, the battalion chiefs, and sometimes somebody might have to put their earplugs in because they don't want, want to hear what is about to be said, but that's where it happens at. Absolutely. And I love the fact that you talk about, and, and this was so cool about the fire service because whether it's New Jersey or Maryland or wherever, um, it's the same, you know, you, you and I have a great opportunity to talk to a lot of a lot of brothers and sisters in this job, and, and they all say the same thing. It doesn't matter what rank you are. As soon as you get to sit at that kitchen table, everybody's equal. That's right. And I, I think if you're one of those bosses that isn't doing that, you're doing something wrong, and you got to fix it because that's the time where you have to bond. That's the time where you have to all be together and you know be vulnerable because you have to be, and that's the place to do it. Well, they always say that if uh, if you're in the fire department, probably any other job, if you walk into the room and everybody shuts up or walks out of the room, yeah, it's time for you to retire. Uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know? and, and those are like clear messages without saying a word. <laughs> and, and if you're in the fire department, you know that absolutely. The day that I walk into a room, people shut their mouth <laughs> or walk out of the room is the day I need to crawl into a hole and retire. Yeah, and it, it, it's a sad day for sure, man. Sad. Absolutely. So brother, this book, it's so cool, man. I mean, uh, reading this and seeing what this was about, this, this is more than just a passion, right? I mean, this is, how the hell did this start for you? Uh, I, I, it's hard to explain. Uh, so I didn't start working on this book until six years after he was locked up and uh it was kind of one of those things it, it's a it's a long story but basically what happened was i was sitting at the volunteer firehouse in, in calvert at, at huntington i was the chief there and uh, my deputy chief is a wagon driver at 10 engine dc trinidad and he said whatever happened to that guy thomas sweat because what happened was he was arrested in 2005 and the news broke that you know he confessed everything that he was going to serve two consecutive life sentences, uh, but you never heard anything else. And 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 Brian, the wagon driver, my deputy chief said, "I wonder why he ever did that." And I said, and I was joking. I was sitting in front of a computer. I was joking, and I said, "I'm going to find him, find out what prison he's at. I'm going to write him a letter. I'm going to write a book about it." And I was joking. I had no. This was a joke. It was a joke. I had no intentions of writing a book about him. Um, but I did, I found him, I found out what prison he was in. Uh, and I found out that all you needed to know was a person's inmate number. Um, and you could write them a letter, but there was more to it. I mean, I, I went online and found out that numerous people had written to him, okay. uh, book authors, movie producers, people in the film industry. They wanted a story because there's never been an arsonist like that in the history of this country. And, uh, I wrote him a letter and it, it, in the book, it's uh, it's in the introduction. It's It was just a three quarters of a page. I think it was three paragraphs. I wrote him and I just basically said, listen, I work in DC. Uh, I work at 30 Engine, which a lot of his fires that he lit were in that area that I had gone to. Um, fire behavior, you know, uh, is something I enjoy because uh, I went to college for it, which he enjoys fire behavior because he was, he was an expert at the fires that he lit. And I just said, I want to write a book about it. Um, and I think the fact that I was a firefighter and understood him and wasn't going after it for money. Uh, cause I wasn't up, you know, in Hollywood. Is what it sounds it, like, this sounds like backdraft. 
Yeah, I mean, pretty much. Yeah. And, and there was a lot to it also. I mean, you know, uh, but I, I wrote him the letter and uh, days later, I got a collect phone call from a prison and it was his, his, his voice on the other line. But because I wasn't part of his uh, group that he could talk to, okay. we weren't able to talk. And then a few days after that, I got a letter from him and uh, it took seven years total uh, to get the book out because three years we talked on a daily basis, but it was, what, if you what asked, I think it was April of 2011. If you asked me then if I was not going to be able to write a book about this, I'd have, I'd have laughed in your face. So what was it like to talk to, talk to this guy on the phone and, and, and have conversations? Well, uh, listen, he did this for 28 years. He was an expert at what he did. Uh, he killed people. Mm-hmm killed at least four people uh, that we know of. Um, so he's demented. Um, but here's what I've told people. And and people have listened to me talk to him on the telephone. And maybe this is why one of the reasons he got, a, got away with what he did. He is, if here, here's the best way I can explain it. If you were having a terrible day and needed to hear somebody's voice on the phone, this sounds weird. His voice would calm you. He has the most calming, caring, soft voice that you could ever imagine. And you listen to that, but then you also remember the destruction that he's caused. I mean, he lit hundreds, if not thousands of fires and killed people. And None of those people that he did that to, he was linked to. He just did that out of whatever was going on inside of his head. And did he ever did he ever tell you like why he's doing this? I mean, obviously that's what the book's about. But I mean, when you you had your private conversations with him, what did you get out of this? So here's the thing: the uh, the ATF many years ago developed a profile of what a serial arsonist is. And anybody in the fire department will know that, you know, usually a serial arsonist is a young, white, uh, straight male. Thomas Sweat was black. He was 50 when he was arrested and he was a homosexual. Um, so he, he broke the profile. Yeah, it doesn't and meet the profile at all. He, 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 yeah. he broke that. And then they have a they have a list of why people do what they do when they light fires. And usually it's out of greed, insurance, you know, there's, there's five different criteria. He broke all that also because every fire that he lit, he wasn't connected to these people. The reason he lit the fires was because first of all, he wanted what he couldn't have. So when he was arrested, he was, uh, he worked at Kentucky fried chicken in DC. Um, so he didn't have a lot of money. He shared an apartment with his sister in Southeast, um, and he was a homosexual. So he would find, uh, in 1983, I believe it was, he, uh, he lit a fire off of North Capitol Street that killed two people. And the reason that happened was he was walking uh, out of work one day, and he saw this attractive mail. It was snowing outside. It was January. I think it was 1983. And uh, he saw this attractive guy sort of following him down the road and he saw the guy walk into his house. But when he walked into his house, first of all, he had a beautiful house that Thomas Sweat knew he couldn't afford. Right. But then he saw him uh, kiss a woman, which was his wife. So he knew he wasn't gay. That infuriated him. So he burnt their house down because, and killed both of them because he, he couldn't have the guy and he couldn't have the house. But most importantly, the, the main reason that, that he did a lot of what he did was because it, uh, it got him off sexually. Uh, wow. he, he, he masturbated to these fires and he recorded a lot of these fires. Wow. That's nuts, man. And to be a firefighter and you know, our whole, our whole thing is we put the fires out and this guy's creating the fires. I mean, it's just such a polar opposite dynamic, man. Yeah. What he did is, uh, is, is something you can't imagine, but I will tell you that, uh, listen, firefighters, we don't ever want to see somebody's house destroyed, but we're also not going to complain if we go to a fire, you know, uh, at, at that time, you know, when I worked for DC, 
shift time ended at seven, but typically we we relieved like five, five thirty. You know, if you got to work after five or five thirty to relieve somebody, people talked about you. You know, uh, when Thomas Sweat was on the street and he was lighting fires on a regular basis, uh, in those areas where he was lighting fires at, because he had particular areas that he was he was hot and heavy. Relief time was three, three thirty. Because the last thing that you wanted to do was come to work and there was nothing in your firehouse because they were out fighting a fire. So people were fighting, getting to work oh, yeah. uh, to get on the nozzle uh, or to ride the bar on the ladder truck to relieve those guys so they could catch those fires because they knew 3, 3.30 is when he was going to light a fire. And, and he did this how many years total? 20, 28 years. Man. That is unbelievable that he went that long. There's there's a lot of things that... that uh, that worked in his favor. And, and this is just, this is just my opinion. Uh, for, first of all, he, he wasn't connected to anybody. So they couldn't link him to insurance or being angry at somebody. These were just complete random victims. Uh, he also started lighting these fires uh, at a point in time in DC when crack cocaine was a mm-hmm. huge epidemic. Marion Barry was the mayor. Uh, we didn't have any money. So they, they, they didn't investigate fires like they do nowadays. Um, the other thing was there were no cameras. I mean, everybody will tell you now in the fire department, cameras and social media will kill you, oh, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. That stuff didn't exist. There were no cameras back then. There were no uh, street cameras, red light cameras, security cameras, people with phones. None of that stuff existed. Right. Um, and the other thing is, is there was no DNA uh, back then. DNA is what ultimately got him locked up. But he was just randomly driving around through D.C., uh, P.G. County, Maryland, Montgomery County, Maryland, and parts of Northern Virginia, you know, just randomly finding targets and lighting their houses on fire. And it was also at a point in time where those jurisdictions didn't talk to each other about the fires they were having. They were they were completely separate. So they weren't able to add anything up. It wasn't until he uh, had a couple high profile fires where people were killed where they finally started looking at things and saying, listen, this, these look very similar to yeah, these look familiar. Art. Yeah, exactly. So what, what was it, what was it like for you mentally to be able to, to transition into this new world of being an author and, and, and talking to this guy and interviewing him? I mean, did it, did it mess you up a little bit as far as, uh, I mean, cause you're in the, you're almost in this guy's brain for a little bit, right? Uh, Everybody, everybody asked me that question, you know, how did it affect you? I, it didn't really affect me. Uh, I don't think so much for a long time. Uh, because I honestly, I, I was getting information that nobody else had. So one of the things he did when he was locked up was he made an agreement with the investigators that he would tell them everything that he did, uh, the fires that he had lit, where they were at. I mean, he was fires. They didn't even know he had lit. That he would tell them everything he did and his motives. And in exchange, there would be a gag order on those investigators and they would never tell his motives. He didn't want his motives out. He was embarrassed, I guess. I don't know. Um, so talking to him, uh, I, I was getting this information nobody else had. A matter of fact, when, when we were talking and writing, during those three years, the only people that knew were the guys that I worked at worked with at Engine 30. They, they knew about it. Nobody else did. Yeah. Um, and then about three years into us talking, so the book is a biography, but it's the main thing is it's a biography of his life, but it's I wanted to know the motives of why he did what he did. Yeah. Um, and here's what I tell everybody. At, at some point in time, if you sit down with a person, you're going to find out their entire life story mm-hmm. and everything you need to know about them. Uh, and that happened about three years into us talking. He ran out of stuff to talk about. It was also the same time that I met my wife, uh, but we were just dating at the time. And he was running out of things to talk about. And his attention and the direction of what we were working on, him and I, quickly changed because he had nothing else to talk about. And, and I left a lot of this out of the book. Uh, anybody that reads the book can read in between the lines because there's stuff that I intentionally didn't put in there, but 
towards the end of it in those three years, uh, I would we would talk on the telephone at night or he would write me a letter and his attention was turned towards me in a homosexual way. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I figured uh, out going to happen, honestly. I mean, yes, yeah, so I would, you know, I was dating my wife and, and I was going to see it's going to happen. Yeah. I was date, date my wife and I was saying, listen, I'm just letting you know, eight o'clock every night, this guy calls me, um, uh, especially writing a book about it, which I hadn't even started. I hadn't done nothing. Right. Uh, cause I still didn't know if it was going to happen. I, I never thought this would happen. Um, and when, when he would call me, you know, she's intrigued. She's like, what you're talking to this arsonist? I, I gotta hear this. Yeah. Um, and for a while, it was fine. But at the end, when he didn't have nothing to talk about, he, you know, he would masturbate on the phone to me and stuff like that. And I had to hang up. And uh, I eventually had to call it quits. And yeah. I had everything I needed to put a book together. That's crazy. Very crazy. Yeah, that's what I'm. That, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, it must have been like, you know, mentally draining too, because you're you're not you're not talking to a normal person. You're not talking to someone who's sane. That's when I had to call it quits. You know, when he was telling me about. Uh, fires that he had lit he was very descriptive about the people being on fire and wow and the opening statement of the book is him talking about masturbating to a fire that, honestly that stuff didn't bother me i knew he was demented uh you know everybody's got issues but when he started focusing his attention towards me right uh, one of the things i do now is i travel to colleges and i, I teach uh i i, I give lectures at, at colleges about this book to uh, sociology classes and criminal justice classes and everyone's like, I can't believe you talked to this guy. And for the longest time, it was fine. It was towards the end where I finally realized that what have I gotten myself into? You know, I've been yeah. talking to this guy and Ooh, yeah. this is, this is the road that it's leading down. Um, I've had some psychologists read the book and they've told me that the way his brain operates is the exact same way a pedophile brains operates, um, which is interesting. I don't, I don't know much about that, but he's definitely got some, some serious issues and, um, he's going to be in prison for the rest of his life. Good. That's what I mean. Obviously that's where he belongs. Now the, the book, talk to me a little bit about what it was like for you to, <laughs> to write a book. I mean, you know, th this is cool. Hell it was hell. Yeah. Uh, so, it, I, I talked to him for three years. During those three years, you know, letters, emails, phone calls, collecting all that. I, I probably had, I don't know, I think I have probably 5,000 pages of letters locked up in a safe. Wow. Um, and then when I finally called it quits with all that, I had to take all those letters and come up with a book, something that you could actually read because his letters bounced all over the place. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so it took me two years to, to actually put a book together. Um, but then it took me two years to find a publisher. Um, so the entire project was seven years. Finding a publisher was the worst thing in the world. Um, I almost gave up and self-published it. Uh, but I, I lucked out at the end and, and found a really good publisher in Virginia um, that actually knew, knew rem remembered this case. Um, and then I, like, like I told you before we started that, you know, I thought that once the book was published, I was done. I washed my hands clean and just let the book do whatever it needed to do. But, you know, it's constant work uh, to get this out there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and again, this is, this is one of the reasons we're doing this episode, man. So uh, a lot of these, our brothers and sister firefighters can see, you know, the, the amount of work you put into this. And also there's, a, there's another story to tell here. And that is that, you know, there's more to the fire service, you know, there's, there's other things you can do outside of the fire service. And this, this is one of them. I mean, this, you should be really proud of yourself. And this is like a huge endeavor you took on. I, and I, I gotta be honest with you, not anybody can do what you did because some people wouldn't be able to handle that mentally because it, it's daunting for one, uh, not to mention the, the whole toll it took on you and your family, but the outcome's cool. You got this book. How can people get this book, bro? You can go on Amazon, you can go on Books A Million, uh, Barnes & Noble, Walmart. It, if you go online and type in Thomas Sweat, uh, you'll find it on there. You can go on the publisher's website, Mascot Books. Uh, you can get it hardback, audiobook, uh, ebook. You can get it just about anywhere. What's the future for you, bro? Is this is this something you're looking to do more of, or, or was this it for you? <laughs> uh, uh, 
as far as me writing another book, I don't know about that. Uh, the the goal now is to get this out into uh, a Netflix documentary or a movie or, or something of that sort. That may or may not be in the works. We'll see what happens. Oh, good, very good. Well, I, ho- I hope that works out for you. I, I know if it, if it happens, I'll definitely be watching because this is uh, it's an interesting stuff, and I love the fact that uh, you you've dedicated so much of your life to the fire service, both on a volunteer level and the career level, and to watch um, your progression is, is really cool. You know, you got the side business doing CPR training. You, you're writing books. You got your, your family scored up, man. Everything everything looking good for you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Listen, I really appreciate coming on the show. I mean, you know, I always ask people um, about people in your life that maybe were there for you, that maybe gave you that push or kick in the ass. You know, cause sometimes we need that. We certainly do. Is there a one person in your life or multiple people that that you want to thank for your career as a firefighter right now? Yeah, absolutely. So Larry Patton was the one that kicked me in my ass when I was a young teenager in the firehouse who I never thought I was going to graduate high school, let alone uh, graduate with two degrees. Larry Patton, I, he was a godsend. Uh, and then when I had the manuscript of the book written, but wasn't sure what I was going to do with it. Uh, I can't thank Alan Brunacini. If you read the book, he wrote the forward of the book. Uh, he's no longer with us, but he wrote, wrote a tremendous board of the book. Alan Brunacini, uh, Dennis Rubin, and Dr. Burton Clark. If you're in the fire department, you know who yep, those three people are. They're heavy hitters. They wrote uh, some phenomenal things for the book, and they still to this day are, are the ones that have propelled me forward to uh, keep moving in the right direction. They, I, I can't thank them enough. They just they've done a lot for me. That's awesome, bro. Well, it was actually uh, it was actually cool to to be able to sit down with you. Unfortunately, I, I would have loved to do, do this in person, uh, you know, at the kitchen table at the firehouse and and break some bread and, and do it the right way. But unfortunately, with everything going on, this Zoom thing is is how it has to happen. But uh, it, sucks. it does, man. It, it really does take away the uh, you know that personal touch, bro. But uh, I, I appreciate you coming on the show and uh, having an opportunity to sit and talk with with Penny Q and. and Really, for me, it was really cool to learn how this all kind of started for you and uh, how much time you put into it. So I, I wish you much more success on uh, selling this book. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure you go check this out, get this book for yourself and uh, see what it's all about. And of course, brother, stay safe. You know, I know I'm going to get beat up because I'm not supposed to say stay safe because it's impossible in our job. <laughs> but uh but yeah, go home, go home to that family of yours, bro. And uh, looking forward to seeing more of you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, bro. Stay safe. You too.